Hello, and welcome to the panel on interoperability, interoperability here, there, and everywhere, <laughs> in uh, several pieces of regulation and several technical applications. So uh, I am Vittorio Bertola, I'm the head of policy of, for Open Exchange, which is a German open source uh, software and service uh, company, uh, mostly in the email and DNS space. And uh, I will be, uh, before introducing all the other panelists, I will be giving you uh, an explanation, of, basically, of why interoperability has becoming uh, so, so important. Because I mean, if, you, if you are here in Brussels, I mean, you have, will have noticed that all of a sudden, in the last year or two, interoperability has become sort of a buzzword, a magic word, uh, which is coming up uh, in several different pieces of regulation as the potential solution for everything. And I mean, for someone like me, I mean, I, I have a gray suit because now I am a policy person, but 25 years ago, I was the kind of young person writing code up to the 3 a.m. and in, in the room. And uh, so as a, de a developer, for me, interoperability was something that was completely natural. So the, the first thing that we, we should say is that interoperability is not a new concept. Actually, it is a, an attempt to get back to the origins of the internet. So the internet was originally meant to be interoperable and its architecture was designed in interoperable forms. And all the services, that, let's say the early services that were conceived in the 80s and 90s, like email, DNS, or the web, uh, were built since the beginning as interoperable services, in which you could just get the, the implementation of the protocols uh, into open protocols uh, from any supplier, and uh, you could have clients and servers by many different uh, providers and software makers. You could write your own, and, and you, you can get an email address from anyone, any provider, and uh, or run your own, and still be able to communicate with everybody else. It's the new services that have been coming up in the, in the last 20 years that are not interoperable, but uh, they are the exception, not the norm. So what we, what we should do as a technical community is try to push back the original principle. And um, I think this is really a, a fundamental moment in which we have to do, because what happened uh, in the last 20 years is that we allowed, through possibly the lack of sufficient regulation, we allowed the internet to be closed down and the services to be closed down. And I mean, we, we allowed the, the, the internet to turn into a set of walled gardens owned by very few, very big companies. And we are at a point in time, and this is at risk of getting worse, because we, as we have seen, now we are entering the AI age, and now the, there are, again, very few companies, um, mostly the same, that are building these machines, that are learning from, some, some actually say stealing from. There's, there's an interesting debate on compensation of learning sources for, for AIs, but they, they are learning from the knowledge, the code, the art of the entire humanity, and then they are, I mean, becoming actually better at doing this. And, and possibly creating new forms which surpass the ones that were created by the humans and are even better and are making them redundant in a way. And they are closing them down. I mean, at least depending on the rules that we will have, there is the risk that, this, that the knowledge, the code, the art of will be progressively closed down. So this is why we have to restate that interoperability, openness are fundamental principles, not just I mean, nice to have for competition and, for the, and in general for the technology, but they are fundamental to preserve the openness and the democracy in, in our society. So with this very low stake that I wanted to set, <laughs> I will now, well, I, I will let the panelists introduce themselves so they can, I mean, as, as soon as they speak. We, we structured this panel into sort of sub-panels on specific uh, implementation cases of interoperability. And we are going to start from messaging, especially instant messaging. You know that the Digital Markets Act, which was approved last year, introduces mandatory uh, interoperability clause for uh, actually any number-independent intercommun uh, interpersonal communication service, which means instant messaging mostly, but also email. So we have Amandine, and I uh, will let her introduce herself, that will uh, in, I mean, uh, introduce the topic, explain what we are talking about, and then I will let the other panelists also comment. So please, go ahead. Thank you, Victoria. Um, hello everyone, my name is Amandine Lepap. I'm CEO of Element and co-founder of Element and Matrix, which is an open source project which has been mentioned a few times on this stage already today. The idea of Matrix is to provide an interoperable secure communication layer. So basically break all these uh, silos, walled gardens of chat, in, um, voice over IP, video, uh, that exists today so that as a user I can choose where I want to host my data and I can choose which application I use to communicate without having to, uh, uh, to just trust blindly one, um, one provider. So as Vittorio said, uh, 
the Digital Markets Act, uh, which has been coming out, uh, was voted at the end of last year, is very interesting in terms of actually trying to break uh, these big um, these big silos and making sure that the European markets are more open to help both the users and the companies. So it has the Digital Markets Act is actually covering several um, angles and there are uh, items about self-preferencing, bundling, all sorts of things. The one where we have been interested in mostly uh, with our matrix hat on has been the interoperability around messaging. Um, the idea is to designate these big companies which go beyond the threshold of revenue or market capitalization and play a role of um, uh, gatekeeper as on the European market, which means that anyone wanting to communicate would have to go through these. So they haven't been designated yet, but it's very possible that people like WhatsApp, for example, are designated as a gatekeeper or meta or uh, iMessage, for example, and this sort of people. So the idea here is to, the regulation is forcing these gatekeepers to open up their communication APIs to other third party players who may want to interoperate with them, and they have to do so whilst preserving the end-to-end -end encryption if they are end-to-end -end encrypted. Because there are a whole bunch of people out there who are not end-to-end -end encrypted, so that, that makes it a bit easier. It's um, from a, um, a user perspective, it's basically going back to what I was talking about earlier. You know, as Vittorio says, for email, you choose where you register your email account. Do I want it on Gmail? Do I have to use my work one? Do I, can I use Proton? Um, it's, I can choose where it is, but for chat, I have no choice. And once I created my email address, I can access my email from uh, the email client I want. It may be Outlook, it may be the, app, the mail app on my iPhone, it may be straight from my web browser. I still access my emails, it's the same content. Why, for chat, do I have to change the user interface to change the content? It's so weird that it doesn't exist. So the D DMA is actually trying to fix that so that smaller companies can also um, create a new market uh, that, to open up the opportunities for so smaller companies. Someone was talking earlier on stage about how the market in Europe is full of contenders. And I'm sorry, I cannot remember who it was, but it's true. Basically, the big gatekeepers are usually American companies. And in Europe, we're trying to actually provide innovative, different um, propositions that may be competitive with them. But we cannot because they have the big networks and we cannot break into it. So from a business perspective, what the DMA is bringing is small companies in Europe may be able to interoperate from, uh, with existing networks and access the users of the existing networks to provide a different value add. Think about a small company wanting to provide a spe specialized messaging app for elderly, for example then today they cannot because it means that the rest of the family would have to install the same app. Why they could have interoperability between the app from my grandmother and WhatsApp and this sort of things. The, uh, it's basically lowering the, the barrier to entry for the, um, uh, for the smaller uh, contenders in Europe. So the gatekeepers have obviously been pushing hard against this saying, firstly, that it was technically impossible. Oh my God, you want us to change and open up? This is impossible. Technically, I cannot see how it can work. So the thing is, we had been with Matrix doing it for almost nine years now, and we were able to say, guys, this exists. There is an 80 million user network out there which is doing interoperable and to an encrypted communication. So now, basically, there's a lot of work to be done to prove this and help people implement this in the right way. Um, there is another pushback around data privacy. We're saying, but if people are using WhatsApp, then they sh they're sure that the data is staying in WhatsApp. Yes, the, the thing is, they have no choice but give their, their data with WhatsApp, at least with the interoperability. The key thing is being clear that the data is actually going out of WhatsApp. If 
I want to talk to my grandmother using this specialized application, it may be more important for me to be able to have this interoperability, and if the data is going somewhere else, and I'm aware of it, it's a conscious choice. It's all about choice. And that's why it's so important to uh, be able to implement this properly. And uh, it's a great step, step forward. Yeah, okay, and thank you. And Jurgita, do you have any, anything to add? I'd like to see the perspective of an email company. Um, I think I will give a, a perspective uh, definitely also from just me being a user. Um, I'm really excited by this opportunity presented by the Digital Markets Act and I'm uh, really excited to see one day also as a user uh, a possibility to be able to message from my one messaging app that I prefer to other messaging apps. I think it would be really great uh, because uh, as Amandine mentioned, I really, uh, it's quite burdensome for a user to have five, six, seven different messaging apps to be able to reach your friends and family. And sometimes you want to, to quit one messaging app because, for example, the privacy standards are not the standards that you would like to have. But you won't because all your family is there, all your friends are there. And I really see no reason why it should not be possible to to be able to uh, access uh, those people in other messaging platforms. You know, they did this for telecoms many decades ago. Everybody was saying the same, it's not possible. We should all be staying uh, in different, uh, you know, with different telecom providers. And I don't know, ideally have different phones for different telecom providers and things like this. The same happened in the energy sector. Now a consumer can choose um, different even energy providers. So so can you imagine it's possible in the energy sector to choose your electricity provider, your gas provider, and how come we were not able to you know, connect the messaging apps and things like this? So I think this is a really exciting times and it will greatly benefit users. And uh, yeah, I, we also heard uh, um, a lot of different arguments regarding end-to-end -end encryption. Obviously, we're an email service, so we're interoperable. And uh, you know, things can be possible with a, and in the end-to-end -end encrypted environment. And uh, this cannot be an argument not to provide consumers with the right to choose to use services that they want to. Thank you. And Gabriele, introduce yourself and then... Sure. Um, hi, I'm Gabriele Colombro. First of all, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm the general manager of Linux Foundation Europe. We recently launched in uh, September last year. But I'm here with my second hat. Uh, um, I'm the executive director of Finos, the FinTech Open Source Foundation, talking about uh, an industry that's been pretty locked in for the last uh, you know, decades, or pretty much ever. Um, and, and so I actually approach regulation from a very pragmatic standpoint with one of the few vertical foundations um, and definitely one of the few in regulated industries. Yes, banks do open source. Seems uh, pretty uh, strange to hear. Um, but um, when I think about DMA, uh, I, uh, I have to think about what happened with PSD2. And, um, you know, of course, as a, as a very corporate, in some ways, of course, we have uh, uh, a lot of individual contributors, but you know, the large contributors and members of our foundation are banks. And so for me, I always have to lead with you know, why you want to do open source, why there is business value in, in what you're doing, and that is for each of the constituents, where is the you know, banks, asset managers, regulators themselves, and of course, individuals, and individual users. Um, and you know, when PSD2 was introduced in 2018, um, of course, the initial reaction of regulated industries is always, you know, one of, of irritation of, oh, this is impossible, or this is, you know, uh, going to massively add costs to our bottom lines. Um, and, you know, true, they are regulated industries, they have to burden, uh, you know, to have the burden of regulation. But if I look back, and I kind of want to uh, uh, get the numbers right, that was a regulation that has indeed uh, had sort of three major, I think, uh, positive effects. Uh, one, uh, it opened up really the fintech sector. Um, there would not have been the sort of massive explosion of fintech that we've seen in the last few years, especially in Europe, uh, which brings me to the second point. 
actually uh, from 2018 to 2019 when the regulation was introduced, uh, European fintech has grown faster than American fintech, uh, almost like 24% versus 18%. Uh, again, what, bringing forward you know, the role of Europe in, in sort of the global stage. Um, and then number three, a you know, couple of years later, banks themselves uh, started realizing that, you know what, there is an actual market to be had here uh, in, in you know, providing access to APIs. And again, for those who are not familiar with PSD2, is really about providing uh, access to customer and account, uh, sorry, payments and account information uh, to sort of the rest of, of uh, the ecosystem. And it really created an open ecosystem. Now, when I think about the DMA, kind of going to the question, um, you know, one problem with PSD2 is that it really applied only to banks, uh, primarily to financial institutions. Uh, DMA has the potential to fix that because as you were saying, it applies to gatekeepers. Uh, banks, of course, having been gatekeepers of the financial system forever, but it does apply to big tech. It does apply to effectively uh, companies that under PSD2 had the potential to benefit even more than the small and medium businesses uh, uh, you know, that were created in the fintech wave, because ultimately they could get access to the data, but they were under no obligation to uh, you know, give the data back. And so that's what I'm, I'm really looking forward to, the DMA. Uh, I'm really looking forward especially to the vertical uh, interoperability and the uh, uh, you know, data portability requirements that it comes with. Yeah. If I may. Um, it's very, it's uh, completely bringing up the level of service and value that one can bring to the user. Because if you're a gatekeeper and you have a complete monopoly on something, then of course you don't need to innovate. Who cares? Yeah. Whereas here, anyone can come, and that's also linking to the open door discussion earlier, like anyone can come and innovate. At least you're not starting from scratch. Otherwise, if you created a new messaging app, you would have to first to reinvent the wheel, and no, messaging is not easy. That's why we have so many silos. You start thinking it's easy, but it's really hard, especially if you want to add into an encryption to it. And uh, then you have to differentiate, but you have so little users that it's tough to actually bring up. So for the gatekeepers, it is an opportunity to actually show the value they are actually bringing beyond just being a network. Yeah. And I will add that the interoperability is also good for sustainability, which is a hot topic now, because in the end, of just imagine, I mean, how many resources, bandwidth, uh, battery you are consuming by having like 10 messaging apps running at the same time on your device. I think this could also be saved and maybe we could do a little also for, for the planet. So I think that there's a lot to be gained and I mean, the DMA, I mean, the, the, the instant messaging, messaging part of the DMA was maybe the, the, the most visible one. But there are other clauses which are related to, for example, opening up uh, operating systems on mobiles and preventing, I mean, self-preferencing and defaults and um, allowing users to actually have a choice. And there's uh, an interoperability clause for uh, payment systems and for identity. So maybe we should now switch to that because identity is actually one key theme. I mean, especially logging, you know, we, we have this big EI dust thing, which is good for public services in Europe, and it, it's growing now, there's a revision going on, but it's so traditionally a very complex thing, and it, they're making it more com even more complex. So uh, in, in some countries, they don't even have, like, the mobile aut authentication we have in Italy, like Speed. They use uh, EID cards with uh, chips and smart card readers, which are very secure, but nobody wants to use them because it's just too complex. And so people use Google and Facebook and Apple logins all the, over the web. And this means that, again, the gatekeeper control all the credentials, the identification of people, and potentially get to know, I mean, every place I, I go on the, on the web and where every place, every service I log into. So we should be opening up this as well. And th this is technically possible, again. So I, I want to get back to your Gita and discuss this. If, if you have any uh, considerations or ideas on how we can open up identity and identification systems through interoperability. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Victoria. So I'll quickly present myself. Uh, my name is Zergita Mensevichte. I'm the head of public policy and government affairs at Proton. Uh, Proton is a privacy communications company. We provide now an entire um, product suite of different uh, private tools, and uh, our goal is to enable people um, to have an ecosystem of uh, privacy-focused tools that would allow them to 
protect their data and basically you know, open up uh, possibilities to a more private uh, and fair um, internet in the future. So uh, identity and identity uh, systems is a very important question and um, DMA will, I think, introduce um, quite a big improvement in this area, opening up uh, this particular systems of the gatekeepers. Um, perhaps the best way to start is to provide uh, an example. Um, how gatekeepers use identity systems to essentially keep the whole ecosystems uh, closed off for a competition. Um, and the good example of that is the Android case. So currently, if um, one buys an Android device, um, the only way to actually access the device and to set it up is to get a Google account. Um, to get a Google account, you actually need a Gmail address. While technically uh, it is possible to get a Google account without a Gmail address, it is so complicated that no average user is able to do that. So, in fact, I tried it myself and spent a good hour on that, and I didn't manage. I, I really didn't find a way. So it's really open to only very tech-savvy uh, people, uh, these type of things. Then, so that means you buy your phone, you pay quite some money for your phone, you are obliged to get a Google account, you're obliged to get a Gmail account in order to start using your phone, and then here you go, then you want to start uh, downloading your apps. But the only way pretty much to download your apps is to access the Play Store. Uh, if you want to access the Play Store, you have to have a Gmail account, otherwise you will not be able to access it. Of course, some people would say, well, you can have some other uh, uh, Play Store or, or uh, the App Store on the Android. Yes, I also tried that, but then you can't get there most of the apps that you need. So essentially, when you buy your Android phone, you really are forced in a situation where Google bundles together its operating system, its email, and its um, App Store. And so everything is bundled in a such a complicated way that an average consumer really has no choice than just to use the, the Gmail account, the Google account, and to basically be tracked across the device, and not just across the device, but also on, on the web. Uh, I can give you quite an interesting example that for a user to be able to use Proton Mail on the Android, the user has to become first a Gmail user and then going through all those additional steps, be able to download uh, Proton Mail from the, from the Play Store, which is uh, quite crazy when you think about it and it should not be like this. Um, another thing that is worth mentioning is that uh, once you get the, the Google account, uh, they have all those things like sign in with Google and things like this, and then you know it's uh, often tied with the browsers. And so essentially, what happens that you, as a user, you're being tracked not just on your device but across all over internet. So people who don't want that or who want to use uh, more privacy alternatives, uh, currently they don't have um, this opportunity. The good thing with the DME is that there is a provision that will uh, allow um, service uh, users actually to have a choice, which means that gatekeepers will not be allowed to force on end users or business users uh, their identification systems. And I think that will bring tremendous benefits to consumers. First of all, uh, for consumers that really want to have a choice. Uh, of course, consumers who want to continue using um, the available gatekeepers identification systems, they can continue to do so. It's a free world. But the ones who want to have a choice and who want to have more privacy-preserving alternatives will be able 
to have a choice uh, not to use, for example, the Gmail uh, to access their Play Store or access their, in general, the Android device, if we come back to the Android example. So I think this will really open up the whole world and the whole world of opportunities also for different uh, industries, in including European industries, that are quite strong in privacy uh, preserving tools. That means uh, a lot of uh, companies will be able to finally get access to the whole massive closed off markets like Android market, the, the iPhone, uh, the uh, iOS operating system market. So it, there's really a lot of opportunities for already existing companies, but also for future companies to even emerge. And I think that's going to be quite, quite a big deal, finally opening up uh, those systems. Of course, uh, I'm sure there will be efforts to somehow circumvent that and, uh, and uh, you know, make the possibility of this interoperability of identification systems uh, look good on paper. Um, but I think the most important thing is that when regulators will be assessing this works or not is to really look through the eyes of an average consumer whether it works or not. That means can the consumer really have an easy choice to use an alternative? Can consumer uh, enter the phone and for example start using the apps, the Play Store, the, the App Store and whatever all those things in the same short and efficient amount of time and things like that. And I think this will be really uh, a start of uh, exciting time together with other GME obligations to, to really open up, uh, for, first of all, the mobile devices market, which has been really closed off to competition. Yeah. Yes, I agree. It's going to be an exciting time. I hope you're looking into opportunities. So maybe, Amandine, do you have anything to add? Do you want to say, or Gabriele? If you... well, I, I think I could not agree more. I think one... Um, you know, one item that I've sort of learned, one lesson that I've learned uh, in my fintech experience or, or as a vertical foundation is that I think, you know, as, a, as an Italian living in the United States, I have major grievances with, uh, you know, the American banking system and how disconnected it is. Uh, you know, there's been other mentions here today of other shortcomings when, um, you know, public services are sort of left to the market to, to figure out some. And actually, I'm a big fan of, again, uh, 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 sort of turning monopolies and sort of gatekeepers into more open ecosystems. But I do think that it's really important to, and you know, that's what I think, uh, hopefully this can be a call to action for, for the folks here in government. I think starting from consumer rights, it's always the right sort of starting point. But I do think it's super important, and again, that's what I've learned by being able to then make banks sort of build into open source, like into this idea of open source that was really scary a few years ago. Um, I think it's important to make sure that, you know, people realize that uh, open source is, can be a positive sum game, and this type of regulations can be positive for, you know, consumers. Um, and the gatekeepers themselves, besides, of course, the small medium businesses that, you know, actually can sort of make a business whereby it wasn't possible before. I think it's important to pass the message that this regulation is not against the gatekeepers. Oh. It's really in favor of consumers and actually going to be, uh, you know, benefits mm. if we're able to sort of pass the, you know, uh, natural friction that yeah, the regulation no, yeah, introduces. Does that uh, make sense? No, I agree. And uh, I, I think we're, we're going to hopefully get, uh, get them to agree on this, but we'll see. No, Amandine? Do you... I think the only thing we haven't mentioned yet is the fact that interoperability can be achieved by different ways. It can be yes. just like gatekeeper saying, here is how I work, and figure it out, and then you'll be able to talk to me. Or you can actually get some people to define an open standard where everyone, everyone yes. gets aligned with, so that if you just interoperate with the standard, then you can talk to everyone else out there. And um, it's, uh, it's really bringing the openness, bringing the collaboration towards working on the, the 
working together towards something which is useful for everyone, basically. So it's a really interesting approach. I'd like also to highlight that um, it's um, the, the same way Germany is doing a lot of good things in open source, but there, even if there is still a lot to do, we can still acknowledge that Europe is doing a lot of good things in terms of data sovereignty and yes. privacy. And um, per I'm personally very proud that it's, uh, we're a precursor here. And yes, there's a lot of more things to do. And yes, there is a lot of things that could be improved in terms of implementation. And it's not just because the DMA is here and ready to be uh, enforced and ready to be deployed still a lot of work so that it doesn't become a mess to implement and a mess for the users. But yet, when we look across the Atlantic, for example, we're still quite far from there. So, and they're looking at us, and they're trying to get there as well. So uh, I think it's very promising. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, if we look to the West, we see the internet heavily controlled by a few companies. If you look to the East, we see the internet heavily controlled by governments. And what We're Europe is trying to do is <laughs> to find the right middle way in which you have rules and we have all the stakeholders cooperating together in a, in a value framework, which is really important for Europe. So uh, we still have about uh, 10 minutes, so I, I'll go quickly back to the banking sector, asking Gabriele if you still have I mean, things to add to what you already said, and tell us a little about, uh, about that. And then we, we, if we have some time, as I hope, we might also take questions, if there's anything you want to raise, or we might also look at other aspects. But Gabriele? Uh, I just wanted to sort of double down on, on this idea of, of working together, and I think uh, open standards uh, are important, but you know, I come from, I work on both open standards and open source, and I come primarily from the open source side of the house. And I would say the banking sector is one that is more familiar with open standards. I've been working for, well, with standards. Who <laughs> can debate how open they are? Uh, uh, but, you know, I think open source, and, and honestly, we're still at the beginning of this journey, but open source has had the potential to invite regulators to participate in the open collaborative process. Again, it's still a little bit at arm's length. You know, whenever a regulator is in the room, bankers tend to get a little stiff uh, and, or, or shut up, which is sort of not really uh, compatible with the open collaborative uh, uh, process, but that is opening up. And so when I've, uh, you know, I'm hearing a lot of talk about, uh, you know, government OSPOs, European Commission OSPOs. I think it's really good that that starts focusing around consumption, but I think to me the next frontier is when we will have governments and regulators actively participating in the, uh, you know, open collaborative process, in potentially the implementation of a regulation, you know, in a not so long future, hopefully before my kids grow old uh, or my grandkids, you know, they could even just come up with open source reference implementation or machine readable regulation together with the regulated entities. I realize that this seems, you know, far-fetched or far away, but, you know, I think going back to sort of finding value and, and a value proposition for each one of these constituents, the, you know, open source is a positive sum game. I think there is value for each. And um, again, it's something that's been mentioned earlier, but the, the fact that regulators need to talk to the right people as well yep. uh, to actually come up with the implementation. And so far, we've seen some good signs in terms of regulator coming and talking to us, for example. But I think it's key. You cannot uh, have people providing, uh, suggesting an implementation of a regulation like this without talking to the people who actually have been doing that before, yep. are the ones actually implementing the smaller companies who are trying to uh, build against the ga gatekeepers. The gatekeepers who are, you still have to listen to them and what their problems are, but also make sure you talk to the users as well or representative yes. of the users who can actually come back with, well, by the way, don't, don't forget, they're not technical and this sort of thing. So it's a complicated process because you need to be in touch with everyone in the ecosystem, but it's worth it. And Jurgita, do you want to say anything? Um, I just want to say that I think it's uh, really exciting times uh, coming forward. Um, we're really 
still to see the benefits of the whole legislation, but I think the potential is really huge. I mean, internet was meant to be interoperable, and I think we're really taking a lot of steps to, to make those major platforms, major technologies that have become so big and so irreplaceable and so massive, of massive importance to all the users and, and consumers, now we really have to make sure that things that are of so much importance, they really work well together. And I think it's also a big expectation from users as well to just have things working easier, things working together so that you don't have to download 10 different apps, so that you don't have to have 20 different accounts to create the things and accounts that you don't need, but otherwise you're not able to use your device or some other applications. World should be really much more simple, and I think the more there is opportunity for interoperability, the more there is opportunity for different innovators, more companies, more businesses to grow, but also for solutions to satisfy users. And it's really, you know, those solutions provided by gatekeepers, you know, they will stay there and, and users who want to use them, they will keep on using them. But it's all about choice and, and people should have the choice to be able to have control of their devices, of their uh, IT tools the way they want. And as long as this does not compromise certain security systems and things like this, you know, we should be really moving towards the world where things really work, where they become more and more connected, not disconnected and just one major ecosystem, another major ecosystem, and then you have to choose because otherwise you cannot have the benefits of several of them. I really think the future of internet is where there's more interoperability, more connection, and yeah, more happy users and more, more innovative companies. Yeah, I agree. I think we are all in, in agreement. So this is why I am also asking if anyone from, from the floor has any other questions or ideas. I mean, we still have about four minutes. So if, I don't know, Paula is, uh, yeah. Yeah. we'll try to be quick so that we, ah, sorry, I'll give you mine. Where is that? Yeah. So very quickly so that we, maybe at the end we still have like 30 seconds for, for people here to give a final remark. So, Hi, so. well, my question is about a baby elephant in the room. So office interoperability or productivity is still capturing ministries. I was at a ministry last week and the people said we can't move we would like to, to to leave the windows platform but we're locked inside microsoft office documents and we still can't escape after decades of, of trying to get out so i was wondering is there anything where the panel sees any movement in that well painful old dossier yeah thank you i think we had a second question maybe we can take it uh, i mean i think we'll no Okay, no, then we, okay, anyone wants to take this question? Well, we have seen some, like, typically governments, yeah, they've started to move, but it definitely requires strong champions and advocates internally or a huge drive, or, um, like a huge realization, like uh, Daniel uh, Melin earlier was saying from Sweden. It's like, I, we just had this huge realization that we cannot legally use these American platforms to host our governmental data. And that's the kind of things that needs to be clear, basically. And once people understand that, then making the step towards data sovereignty, typically, is a no-brainer. But yes, it's probably an effort in some places, and it needs, to, yeah, needs some champions and a good reason. Legal, legal regulations are usually a, a good reason. Yeah, if I may add, I think that everything is connected. So once you start breaking up the world gardens into, I mean, maybe starting from messaging, then maybe you get also into documents, because nowadays all of this is integrated, and so you need to be able to make everything work together. Which is why, I mean, it's very important to get uh, all the smaller, unfortunately, open source companies to ally and provide services together, like in Germany we are doing. 
And uh, so I, I'm positive, but of course it will take time and it will take political will. So I mean, before giving like that promised 30 seconds to my panelists, there's st I still want to mention that there is one very important interoperability regulation that we didn't get to, which is the Data Act, and especially the possibility to finally switch cloud providers and port your services and move your services from one infrastructure or platform provider to another. And this is still another very important battle that is happening these weeks. And uh, so, I, I mean, it's complex. Maybe it would deserve an entire panel, but uh, this is another thing that we, that we have to keep an eye upon and possibly fight for. So let's start. Uh, who wants to start uh, with the final? So, yeah, sure. I think uh, Data Act is also a, a very important step towards, um, you know, better um, internet uh, era. Uh, from our perspective, obviously, we are very happy about the provisions uh, on interoperability for cloud switching. Uh, hopefully, as a result of this provision, um, users will be able to more easily change their cloud providers. I think that's uh, quite an important thing because, uh, you know, just how this market works. So you will not have, uh, again, five different uh, drive providers. Uh, maybe some people do, it's okay, but normally if you want it to be convenient, you want to use one place. And then it's the same with, like, with email. If you have all your emails in one email provider, um, you basically want to make sure that you manage to import all your data to the new maybe email service that you want to use. So the same with cloud. So hopefully as a result of, of this data act, there is this real and uh, most important easy possibility for users to switch. Uh, not a theoretical possibility, not a possibility where theoretically, uh, uh, let's say, uh, competing companies could somehow engineer some solutions, because we know from our experience that trying to engineer some solutions uh, that are theoretically possible could make you take out from core products entire teams <laughs> of resources and then have to add lots of money into something that is meant not to work, actually. So I, I really hope that uh, this um, interoperability for cloud switching will be a real opportunity for, for actual switching. It just feels like the no, actually implementing what's the internet, the web is meant to be. It's, <laughs> it's such a no-brainer. It's crazy again that it's not doesn't exist yet. I'm just gonna uh, close by saying that I'm super excited uh, of the role that Europe can play on the global scale. You mentioned, uh, you know, regulations that have been then sort of looked up as the de facto standard. I think PSD2 was one. I think GDPR was another one. I live in California, and we're probably the only sort of closer thing to GDPR. Um, I think Europe, uh, between all these regulations, another one is ADAS2. I think the, the, you know, we're launching the Open Wallet Foundation in Europe in recognition of this uh, um, leadership. I think this is a way that Europe can really bring uh, uh, ec local excellence to the global scale and really sort of bring a little bit more of, a, of an even uh, level playing field with the other regions of the world. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. So I, I think that if there is something that Europe is a leader on, it's really regulation and horizontal cooperation among I mean, very diverse environments, countries with different languages and markets. And we should not uh, underestimate how important this is for, for Europe and for the entire world, which needs that kind of cooperation very badly. So thank you all for listening. I think we'll, leave it. <laughs> we'll wait for Paula to come up. And thank you for listening to us.